Hello, I am Baron Dipitus, and welcome to Baron Quippity, a podcast of quips and tips from a hip librarian gamer. Let's get right to it. Welcome to episode 5 of Baron Quippity. The subject of this video might have been perfect for the first episode of this whole podcast, but you know what? Screw it. Now's the perfect time. I'm going to be talking about this dude I've been using as my Baron persona for nearly two years, and I'm sharing this information on his 267th birthday. That's right. The day this video is posted, July 9th, was the day this fancy, white-haired, well-decorated British Navy dude was born in 1753, and his name was the Honorable William Waldegrave, 1st Baron Radstock. Before getting into Waldegrave's history and such, I'd like to first explain why I use this portrait in the first place. As I was beginning to craft my online persona as Baron Dipitus back in 2018, I wanted to make sure I used a profile picture I had the legal rights to use for that purpose. Even then, I had no real ambitions to be famous on the internet or anything, but I knew enough and cared enough about intellectual property, partic particularly copyright, to want to avoid any potential issues down the road. I knew that I would be using the name Baron Dipitus, a name derived from a character I created for an epic D&D campaign the year before. He was a gambling, trickery domain cleric loyal to Lady Luck, and he was named Baron Dippity. Uh, maybe I'll share his story sometime in a future episode. Anyway, I wanted to change it up a little bit, uh, and, and with a name like Baron Dipitus, I thought it would be more than appropriate to look for an old classic portrait of a European baron of some sort, ideally in the public domain. I used a website called Creative Commons to find such an image because creativecommons.org specifically helps make copyright more accessible for creators and consumers alike. In any case, I searched for a public domain image of a baron, and this portrait of William Waldegrave was the one I liked the most. Uh, if you're, if you are, if you can see what's on the, the videos itself, you'll see that I have uh, a few different images. So there's my Twitter profile picture, which is a which is a nice drawing of, you know, Baron smiling and reading a book. Then you have the actual original portrait of William Waldegrave. And also um, I have an image of his memorial as well, which I'll refer back to. But uh, but yeah, th this portrait that you see, the, the portrait in the center um, of William Waldegrave, was the one that I liked the most out of all the ones that I saw. I didn't know anything about him at the time, and I didn't care to look at the time. It looked good, had nice colors, presented that classic look I was going for. Since it was in the public domain, it was legally free for me to use and alter and as I wished, and it would, of course, become my face on the internet under the Berendipitous moniker. Earlier this year, an artist on Twitter named Akiko-sama temporarily offered some free small commissions, so I asked for a drawing of quote-unquote me, or in other, word, in other words, Waldegrave, in the style of a character in Brawlhalla. That is how I got this rather fetching portrait of Baron reading a book with a knowing smile, which I have pictured on the right side of the screen. And this is admittedly a bit closer to who I actually am in real life. Over time, as I began to establish online connections, relationships, and even a small following over under this name and face, it was only natural that I would want to know about the real life of this guy whose portrait I've used so extensively. So, not yet knowing the man's name, I searched for his portrait again and was easily led to his Wikipedia page where I learned his name and general history. You know the great thing about Wikipedia? This is something to keep in mind um, for academic research, whether you're in middle school, high school, college, whatever. Not only is Wikipedia about as accurate as other print encyclopedias out there, or an impossibly gargantuan giant of knowledge, or even free for the whole world to use, but it is also one of the best ways to do two vital things when researching any topic. First, it helps you learn the basic events, terminology, or principles of a thing to get you started. Sometimes you know what subject you want to study, but you don't know what the lingo is or, you know, where to start or whatever. Wikipedia is perfect for that very thing. Two, more importantly, Wikipedia tends to lead you to relevant sources that you can actually cite and use to complete a proper work cited page. Because you can't cite Wikipedia, you can't cite Wikipedia not because, not necessarily because of fears of inaccuracy. It's just that, well, 
it's basically general common knowledge. It's not really, it, it's sort of a conglomeration of all the of all the sources out there. So it's best to use Wikipedia as an overview and as a starting point to find primary and secondary sources from there to see what sources Wikipedia uses, and you can go from there. In any case, um, yes, while Waldegrave's Wikipedia page gives a good summary of his major deeds in life and is short enough for your average internet reader, I was most interested in that area at the bottom of the page that gives you external links. That's where the good stuff is. And as I get into the details of this man's life, know that those sources from external links are where I get the bulk of my information, especially the minor but juicy details. So let's get into it. William Waldegrave, born July 9th, 1753, was the second son of John Waldegrave, who was the third Earl Waldegrave, and um, also the second son of Lady Elizabeth Gower. The Waldegrave family had four children, George, who would become the fourth Earl Waldegrave, William, of course, and then two sisters, Elizabeth and Caroline. Being the son of an Earl, William was already born in a wealthy and influential position in British society. William joined the British Navy in 1766 when he was 13 years old. At age 19, he was promoted to lieutenant, and at 21, he was given command of his very own ship. This, his climb up the ladder of naval command was rather impressive, really. What were you doing at that age? For comparison's sake, when I was 19, I had finished one year of college and was about to begin a two-year volunteer mission for my church. Not knowing what I was going to do with my life, I thought I was going to be a music teacher or a music composer. Didn't end up happening. But anyway, I, went, I began my two-year volunteer uh, mission for my church. At age 21, I finished that mission and dusted off the red American Southwest dirt to walk into my second year of college. I was still barely figuring my life out, and I hadn't even declared a major in college at that point. And at that same age, at 21, William commanded his own freaking ship. Life goals, am I right? Anyway, Waldegrave married Cornelia von Lenap on December 28, 1785, in present-day Turkey, I think, and the two of them would end up with nine children, three sons and six daughters. Nearly a decade after the marriage, in 1794, William was promoted to Rear Admiral and then Vice Admiral the next year. These, these positions were basically a couple of minor steps below Admiral in the Naval, in the naval Command. On Valentine's Day, 1797, was that was the Battle of Cape St. Vincent, which was an early naval battle in the Anglo-Spanish War. During this time of history, America had just recently won their independence from Britain, and the global superpowers of Europe, especially England, France, and Spain, were still duking it out over and over and over again. In the Battle of, Capes, of Cape St. Vincent, William was the third in command of the entire British fleet there, under fellow Vice Admiral Charles Thompson and Admiral Sir John, Sir John Jarvis. England won that battle with 800 casualties on the Spanish side and about 300 on the British side. William was on the ship Barfleur, and there were no casualties under his particular mask, mast, only seven wounded. In honor of their involvement in this British victory, Waldegrave and his fellow vice and rear admirals were offered what is called a baronetcy, which is basically the title and privilege of baron, I believe. However, Waldegrave actually declined this honor, because in case you don't know much about European peerage, baron is actually one of the lowest of these esteemed titles. William, as the son of an earl, was already higher than a baron, technically, so he considered this honor inferior to his current station, I suppose. However, he didn't go entirely unrewarded because he became the governor and commander-in-chief of the island of Newfoundland, a province in Canada which was still strictly under British rule at the time. I just love the fact that he became the governor of a Canadian province because I claim some Canadian ancestry myself, as well as some British ancestry. Anyway, William Waldegrave served in this governor position for three years, which was the standard at the time, from 1797 to 1800. So he was between the ages of 44 and 47 during this particular part of his British service. He didn't live there the entire time, though. He was actually, he was probably actually in Newfoundland only about three months per year during fishing season. This was just the traditional system for that area at the time. Though it was a governing position, it still required a good deal of military expertise because there were numerous attacks from the French on British property. Newfoundland is right next to Quebec, after all. Among these attacks, there was also a problem with local Newfoundland Newfoundlanders. Ugh, 
people from Newfoundland, Newfoundlanders sheltering deserting troops. Another issue that arose early on was a mutiny in the British fleet that had spread there. There was one group of inhabitants, however, that seemed to give Waldegrave the greatest grief. The merchants. They had become a formidable interest group that was strong in influence and well organized in Newfoundland, and their demands seemed to be at odds with what Waldegrave thought was best for the other inhabitants. At one time, Waldegrave described their power as so great that they rule as perfect desp despots, being the sole possessors of the meat, drink, and clothing by which their wretched subjects are supported. He wrote to London, recommending that local magistrates, the civil officers or judges, should be paid salaries supported by a tax on rum and other goods to remove those things from merchant influence. Upon learning of this, Chief Justice Richard Routh asked the merchants in the town of St. John's what they thought of this tax, and those merchants obviously hated it. Waldegrave was very upset at Chief Justice Routh for bringing it up with them in the first place. As much as he got upset and annoyed with merchant demands, he may, in hindsight, he may have actually been overreacting to a bunch of relatively minor protests. His service as governor wasn't entirely focused on military concerns or squabbles with local merchants, however. It seems he was a decent enough gentleman, judging by the fact that he established a committee for the relief of the poor, which collected money specifically to help the less financially fortunate inhabitants of St. John's. Nearly 300 people, most of them children, were helped directly by this fund during the winter of 1797-98. Waldegrave himself gave generously to that fund, and he got the local garrison and military squadron to donate as well, and strongly suggested that similar funds be set up in other ports, which did happen to some degree, I believe. On June 3, 1800, a new governor named Charles Maurice Pohl would replace Waldegrave as governor of Newfoundland. Later that year, William was honored to be made an Irish peer with the title of Baron Radstock created for him. If you're confused as to why he would refuse a baronetcy earlier only to accept this title now, there is a distinct difference here in that it's a different country offering the title. You see, the Honorable William Waldegrave was already the son of a British Earl, but he had no such title among Irish peers. So having the title of Baron Radstock created for you was a great honor indeed. At the time, it was possible to be a baron in one country, but a count or an earl in another. Now, I must admit, I'm not entirely sure why Ireland gave Waldegrave this honor. Like I said, Baron Radstock was created for him in 1800, but I haven't found a good source that quite explained why, except perhaps for his service back in that Battle of Cape St. Vincent three years earlier. Not sure why it took them that long to bestow that honor, but maybe I still have much to learn about how European peerage works. In any case, Baron Radstock in 1800, and then a promotion to Admiral without the vice, so actual full-on admiral, in 1802, at about the age of 49. He was also honored with the title of Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the Bath, or KGCB. I think that's the large eight-pointed badge you see on the left side of his jacket in the portrait. This seems to be a prestigious order that is named after an order from medieval times that used a sort of ritual cleansing or bath as part of their process of anointing knights. As far as I know, his work as governor of Newfoundland was the last formal employment he had in his service to England. He died 23 years later, on August 20th, 1825, at age 72. According to his online entry in the Dictionary of Canadian Bi Biography, Waldegrave was a curious, conservative, and perhaps hypersensitive governor. He defended with firmness, though not with great skill or patience, the interests of the mother country and responded with, pa with compassion to the distressed members of the local community. There is certainly a fair deal more to this man's history than his three-year term as Newfoundland governor, but most sources I've found that provide significant biographical information tend to focus on that because they are usually focused on Canadian history. So, that is the general biography of William Waldegrave, first Baron Radstock. However, I did manage to find a few more interesting little tidbits that I'll mention here, because they didn't seem fit to fit anywhere else in the episode. Among the external links in the Wikipedia article, there is a link to a finding list of William's manuscript material. Not the material itself, but a list of it. If I ever find myself in a position to access the... the uh, 
uh, Forsheimer collection in the New York City Public Library, I'll certainly check it out. At any rate, most of it is letters he wrote near the end of his life to a London publisher named Taylor and Hesse to help publish Poems Descriptive of Rural Life and Scenery by John Clare. There are also some personal letters to a novelist named Jane Porter and one to another author named Elizabeth Craven. This list also mentions that Waldegrave wrote two books himself, The British Flag Triumphant and The Cottager's Friend, dated 1806 and 1818, respectively. It seems he put much of his retirement, he spent much of his entire retirement invested in literature, which I can certainly get behind that. With some careful searching, I was able to find both of his books online, and I will say they're probably not the most exciting reads for most people. The British Flag Triumphant seems to be a collection of British naval exploits, while The Cottager's Friend is a Christian study book, like it has, you know, prayers and I think like little poems and uh, little, little lessons and things like that in there. Interesting for history buffs and for curious people like me, so, you know, I'll include links to those, as well as links to all other sources I use for this episode in the description below. His grave and a memorial erected in his memory can be found at the St. Thomas Apostle Churchyard in Navestock, Brentwood Borough, Essex, England. His memorial reads as follows. In memory of William Lord Radstock, Admiral of the Red KGCB, second son of John, third Earl of Waldegrave, he was created a Baron of Ireland for his services in the defeat of the Spanish fleet off Cape St. Vincent, February 14th, 1797. Died August 20th, 1825, aged 72 years. His life was devoted to his God and to his country. Also, of his second son, the Honourable Augustus Waldegrave, who was accidentally killed near Mexico while attached to the English mission there. I think it was some sort of hunting accident as far as I can tell. October 26, 1825, aged 22. And of Cornelia Jacoba, widow of the above-named Lord Radstock, who died October 10, 1839, aged 76 years. And then the memorial closes by quoting John chapter 11, verse 25 in the Bible. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. The portrait I've been using for going on two years to represent Berendipitous was painted by James Northcote in 1803, I think, perhaps for Waldegrave's 50th birthday, shortly after he was made first Baron Radstock and a British Admiral and a Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the Bath. The actual portrait is 29 inches high and 23 and 3 quarters inches wide, or 73.5 centimeters high and 60.5 centimeters wide. Not too shabby. I think I found another portrait of him, a simple engraving by Charles Wilkin that could fit in a book, though to me it looks a little bit different from his portrait and his memorial. Then again, portraits weren't usually perfectly accurate anyway. I like the Northcote portrait better, especially since it's in color, because it's in color and seems more flattering, so I'll keep using it. All this was what I was able to find about William Waldegrave, 1st Baron Radstock. In many ways, I suppose he was what you might expect when you think of a typical baron from England, but at the same time, I think it is fascinating to consider the real man who lived and worked and sailed and wrote and spoke in a time of, tum of tumult for both the American and the European continent. I'm not entirely sure whether he and I would actually get along if we were ever to meet, but it seems we have a few things in common sincere Christian beliefs, a desire to help those less fortunate, a quick advancement in cert on certain ladders, though rapid promotions in the British Navy sounds far more impressive than my two-year rise to middling modest fame in the Brawlhalla community, a certain appreciation for literature, and, well, the title of Baron, though I claim it in name only and not in the official title, not an official title or peerage. So, now that I know who this guy was, am I still happy to use his likeness for Baron Dipitus? Certainly. It seems he was an excellent example of a loyal British peer, naval officer, and governor. I find it kind of funny that, under different circumstances, neither you nor I would likely ever know about this man. But we do know, but we do now, just because he, just because he had a very good Baron-like portrait. Life is so very, uh... <laughs> serendipitous sometimes. I just winked at a microphone. I'm a nerd. Uh, so, thank you, Honorable First Baron Radstock. Thank you, William Waldegrave, 
for this portrait you have that is now in the public domain free to use. Thank you for your service to the British Crown, and if we both end up in the same place after this life, perhaps we could shake hands or something. And, well, that concludes this episode of Baron Quippity. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, my friends, make it a great day. All the best.